In the last lecture, we began our treatment of movement, which we distinguished from behavior. We were at pains to look at some very general principles underlying movement that will obtain across the animal kingdom, irrespective of what animal we're looking at. Notice that movement here is quite distinct from behavior. We had previously noticed that to recognize behavior is to recognize it as a particularly goal-directed form of movement. We will return to this point later. Movement becomes an interesting object of study for us because it seems to be the behavior for which nervous systems first evolved. The earliest nervous systems seem to serve the purpose of helping an animal to get around. And get around is perhaps the most abstract, loose, general goal we could possibly admit. And to this extent, locomotion seems to have some similar basis, whether we're talking about the pulsing of a jellyfish in the sea, uh, walking of an ant in the desert, or a caterpillar, or a human. All these forms of movement share some underlying principles. We noted the last day that the wheel doesn't seem to occur in nature, but all these forms of movement are built, as we'll see, on various forms of oscillation. We'll come back to this point as well. We were at great pains to point out that there is a myth in our culture at this time that the brain is responsible for everything. And we can dispel this myth, and we will work hard to dispel this myth. This is not what's going on. The brain is not figuring out where to move, figuring out what part of the body to move, and commanding those parts of the body. This is an inappropriate view of the relationship between the brain and the body. If we were to view the brain like this, we would be giving the brain the role of the puppeteer, and we would be giving the body the role of the puppet. In this particular instance here, we can see a giraffe puppet with four strings. Those are four different degrees of freedom, four different things that the controller, the puppeteer, can pull, can control independently. Now, it doesn't take long to rule this out as a, as a picture of the relationship of the brain to the body. If we look at the physiology and we count the number of strings, as it were, linking the brain to the body, that is, the number of degrees of freedom or things that could be independently controlled, we don't find four. The number goes into the billions almost immediately, so that becomes an inappropriate framework for thinking about movement, which, we, when we observe it, is always coordinated. We also met Rolf Pfeiffer, who has built these charming little robots. All three robots that he illustrated were driven by the same force. They have a central driving wheel, and it's the same in each case, but they exhibited very different behaviours, precisely because they had very different bodies. So today we're going to look and try to enlarge our vocabulary for talking about behaviour for talking about movement and for talking about how different parts of the body come to move together in the service of goals. To do this, we'd have to take bodies very seriously. Bodies are physical objects. Your limbs have mass. They weigh something. They have inertia. And all these physical properties of the bodies are going to become absolutely crucial as we try to understand the form of movements and behavior that we see. This is part of a wider movement within cognitive science at the moment to reconsider the role of the body and recognize the constitutive role it plays in very many things that we perhaps prematurely associated with brains. In locomotion, we're dealing with different parts of the body which are oscillating. Oscillation refers to anything which behaves periodically, which goes through a cycle going forward and backward. This is the pulsing of a jellyfish. This is the beating of a wing of a bird. This is your leg when you're walking. Oscillations are always found in locomotion. We have multiple parts of the body that go through various cycles. Oscillations are periodic processes, and we need a language to describe where something is in its cycle as it goes through a cycle. Now, we see cycles periodic processes throughout nature. We see them in 
inanimate as well as animate systems, we could look at the rotation of the moon about the earth or the earth about the sun and describe those as oscillations. If we want to describe where the earth is in its cycle around the sun, we have the calendar to fall back at. It's Christmas or it's summer. But in general, for oscillate, oscillating systems more generally, we will need to be able to describe where they are in their cycle. I like to use a convention to describe this that uses a number between 0 and 1. So if the cycle starts at what we call phase zero, as we move through the cycle, when we're halfway through the cycle, I'll call that a half. As we're three quarters of the way through the cycle, I'll call that three quarters. When we get complete the cycle, we've just reached one and we switch back to zero. That's my favorite phase convention. Other people like to use the convention of minus pi to pi or zero to two pi. You may remember a circle can also be described as being composed of pi radians, where a radian is the amount of the arc that corresponds to one radius. The convention used is irrelevant. We need simply to note that phase is the language we will need to use to describe where one thing is in its cycle, so that we can describe when we have two oscillating systems where they are with respect to each other. When oscillating systems interact, they frequently become non-independent. We say they become entrained or coupled, and I will use those terms synonymously. So two pendula, for example, if they can influence each other, will become entrained or coupled. We can illustrate this nicely with this system in which five individual separate oscillators are started at five different frequencies. Initially they can't influence one another and then after a while they can and you'll see the result. Now, of course, you saw the five metronomes coming into sync with one another, oscillating in unison in a fixed phase relationship. You also heard something different, though. You also heard each oscillator assert its own autonomy. They moved into and out of this emergent pattern. So each of the five metronomes is an independent system which is drawn into the collective emergent pattern, but also maintains its own identity as a separate entity. This is very important. As diverse processes become coupled, they don't become enslaved by the coupling. To do so would be to become literally a slave to the machine. Rather, we're developing a language with which we can recognize how different oscillating components can become linked coupled or entrained, still retaining their autonomy, but also giving rise in their interaction to patterns at an emergent superordinate level. This will become clearer with a few examples. We are surveying some very general characteristics of animal movement, and we're hoping that there are some simple regularities that can help us to explain the coordination of the limbs in all locomoting animals. We'll stick to animals with limbs for now, we'll leave the jellyfish behind, but even here we've got to deal with animals with two limbs, two legs like us, quadrupeds like a horse, or animals with very many legs like a caterpillar. The hope is that we can learn to view such movement with the right set of theoretical tools and develop a view of such movement develop a model system which will help us to recognize the regularities. As a warmer upper, just to get a feel for the sense that there might be such principles to be discovered, let's consider this illustration of the cycle, locomotion cycle of an inchworm on top and a cheetah on the bottom. 
These animals couldn't be more different. The cheetah is huge and fast, inchworm is slow and tiny. But as you, when you compare the stages in their cycle, you can see that each is making use of simil similar physical principles. At the start of the cycle here, we have a bunched up body. We've got contact with the ground only on, with the rear limbs. So we've got a coiled spring-like effect, which is then unwound as the body reaches forward to land with the front part of the body on the ground. Once it lands, then the, remain, the rear part of the body can be freed from the ground and pulled up, contracted to form a coiled spring again. So this is a general principle that seems to apply to an inchworm and a cheetah. It's therefore an example of the kind of fundamental physical principle that we're looking for. Here's a systematization of the gates of a lot of quadrupeds. In this, every single quadruped gate, that is, form of locomotion of a four-legged animal, can be located somewhere inside this odd jellyfish, jellyfish-like uh, area on a graph. In this graph, the x-axis, horizontal here, is the percentage of the cycle that each foot is on the ground. So a light animal, like this little fella here, spends a lot of time with individual feet off the ground, whereas a big heavy animal like a hippopotamus here will have most feet on the ground most of the time. The y-axis here is the percentage of the cycle that the forefoot follows the hind foot on the same side. So the front leg and the back leg on the same side have a fixed phase relationship in every gait, and that determines where you are in the y-axis. Now every four-footed quadruped gate fits in here somewhere. We can see the horse is represented three times, here, here, and here, each time with a different gate. So a different gate represents a different organization of the limbs with different phase relationships between them. Here are some of those individual gates illustrated. Here's the horse at the top. We saw the last day Edward Moybridge captured the horse, the galloping horse with four feet off the ground. Here's a different kind of gallop found in a deer. And here's a different kind of a gallop found in a cheetah. Here's a gait called a half bound found in a weasel. You can see the phase relationships among the legs is very different. Here, the phase relationship among the legs in the house mouse is quite different. We've got the two front feet in phase, and we've got the back feet coming in at a different point in the cycle. And here's a very weird one, the pronk, in which all four feet do the same thing at the same time, and they're all on the ground only for a very brief period. This pronk it may be known to you from Pepe Le Pew, the cartoon character, but here's an illustration of actual pronk from uh, Springboks in the Kalahari Desert. So the pronk is a very rare form of this coordination, but it shows you that these gates are somehow systematically organized, and we can find out the principles by which we can at least describe the various gates. We would do better if we had a model which we could do experiments on to look at how the different gates relate to each other, when do we switch from one to the other, which gates are we going to find for a given system, and so on. So a model is needed. And we're going to look briefly at a model developed by an Irishman called Scott Kelso. This is a model system for studying coordination, and it's inspired by the notion of, uh, take, taken from the old ad for the Golden Pages phone book, let your fingers do the walking, was the ad. And in this model system, subjects are asked to waggle their fingers at the same frequency. So the fingers are being asked to wag at the same frequency. You can use your fingers or you can use your whole hands for this. What you find is that under those very minimal task instructions, there are only two ways that you can fulfill the task requirements. One way is to wag your fingers in phase so that each finger or hand starts its cycle at the same time and goes through each part of the cycle in synchrony with the other. The other way to do this is like this, where each finger or hand is at a different point in its cycle at all times. When one finger is starting its cycle, the other is halfway through its cycle. This is known as the antiphase mode of coordination. This little model system has some interesting properties that make it a particular kind of coordinative model suitable for studying principles of gait. Here, for example, we can see that 
if we start off in antiphase, that's the, the coordination you just saw, if we start off in antiphase and we speed up, there comes a point at which if you don't actively resist it, the limbs will switch to the in-phase mode where each finger or hand is going through its cycle at the same point in the cycle at all times. So we get a switch from one form of organization, characterized by a fixed phase relationship among the components, to a different form of organization with a different set of fixed phase relationships between the components. Think, if you will, of your shift from a walk to a run. If you walk and you speed up, there comes a point at which your walk cannot be sustained and you have to switch to a run. Now in a biped, like a human, the shift from a walk to a run is not that obvious because in each case the legs are in an antiphase mode of coordination. But they are quite different in their organization. The foot is on the ground for a different period of time in a walk and a run. We see this more clearly in quadrupeds where the shift from a horse, from a trot to a gallop, for example, produces radically different phase relationships among the limbs. In our model system here, we have two gates at, modern spe at moderate speed, two stable modes. We'll call them the in-phase and the anti-phase pattern. At fast rates, we have transition to a single mode. Interestingly, if you start going as fast as you can in the in-phase mode and you slow down, there's no compulsion to switch back to another mode. The system also illustrates some a very important characteristic of complex systems as they shift from one stable form of organization to another. Now we're talking here about locomotion, but this particular signature of a reorganization is well known to physicists, mathematicians, geologists and biologists from a wide variety of situations. We see it in all kinds of complex systems where the complex system has one stable equilibrium and then it shifts to another stable equilibrium. Shortly before that transition, we see a great increase in the amount of variability within the system. We call these critical fluctuations. And it's as if the system, where it's shifting from having a few degrees of freedom, suddenly becoming a system with many degrees of freedom before it can collapse back into being a system with few degrees of freedom again. We see this in the hands as we approach that transition from the in phase, from, sorry, from the anti phase to the in phase mode. But you're familiar with critical fluctuations from an entirely different uh, corner of the world. We can view the arrangement of the plates on the Earth's surface, the tectonic plates, as a complex system whose stable equilibrium results from the interplay of very many forces. But they do sometimes spontaneously adjust and shift from one stable organization to another. And the critical fluctuations that we observe just prior to that shift are known to us as earthquakes. They are also an example of the, this very generic notion of fluctuation prior to a shift in a complex system from one stable state to another. If you look at the stock market, and we have ample data on this, we occasionally see crashes. And just before a stock market crash, prices don't just dive. They go all over the place. We get an increase in the price uh, variability, in the volatility within the, the market just before a stock market crash. So we can interpret that too as a shift from one form of equilibrium, business as usual, to another form of equilibrium, the new normal after the crash. And right before that transition, we get this increase in variability. So these principles are very well known to mathematicians and physicists, and they can help us in understanding how the limbs come to shift abruptly from one form of organization to another. And we've got that in this little model system as well. Now, if an animal has multiple gates at its disposal, let's say a walk, a trot, and a gallop, if the brain were simply the controller, then the brain could choose to use one or other form of organization. But given the approach we're taking here, we might instead look to see if there's some kind of lawfulness that we can uncover in the selection of the gate. And here we're going to look briefly at an experiment done in the 1980s, early 1980s, on three very docile ponies. This was reported by Hoyt and Taylor in Nature in 1981. These three ponies were very well trained. They would walk, trot and gallop at a wide variety of rates on a treadmill. 
and they would do so with a big bag over their nose to measure their oxygen consumption, which you can measure and you can find out how much oxygen is consumed per meter traveled. So this illustration here is a great example of scientific illustration. There's a lot of information and we we'll walk through this picture. First of all, on the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, we have speed. So you can see here the range of speeds over which these horses walked on the treadmill. And there's a much broader range for the trot, and there's quite a wide range for the gallop. And here on the y-axis, we can see on the left-hand side the amount of oxygen consumed per meter traveled. To consider just the walk, first of all, the observations from this speed to this speed, those are the filled triangles here, and you can see the amount of oxygen consumed is different at different speeds, but there is some speed at which the amount of oxygen consumed is a minimum. So this would appear to be an optimal speed from this point of view for walking at. Here are the data for the trot, these open circles. We have a much wider range of speeds covered, and we can see again that the amount of oxygen consumed varies sensitively as we trot at different speeds. But again, there is a, a, a speed at which trotting is optimal, and that's when oxygen consumption is minimized, and it's about here. Here are the data for the gallop over here with the filled circles. We can see again, if you gallop slowly, it's inefficient. You use more oxygen. And as the gallop gets faster, you use less oxygen. The data don't go out far enough to see this go up on the other side, but we can safely assume that it would. So we've uncovered something already. We've found out that there's a lawful relation between the amount of oxygen consumed and the speed at which you are adopting a gait, and furthermore, that there is an optimal speed for each gait at which to walk, an optimal speed to trot, and an optimal speed to gallop. In the second part of this experiment, they let these three ponies out into the paddock and let them walk, trot, or gallop as they saw fit. Nobody was telling them what to do. Under those conditions, if you observe a walk, these black points are simply counts of observations. When you observe a walk, the horses will walk at the speed that's optimal for walking. When you observe them trotting, they're trotting at this speed, which is optimal for trotting. And when they're observed galloping, they're observed galloping at this speed, which is optimal for in terms of oxygen consumption. They do not voluntarily walk, trot or gallop at these intermediate speeds, which would consume more oxygen. It would be understandable, but it would be wrong to deduce from this that oxygen consumption is the key to understanding the organization of the limbs in a gait. A later study looked at a different variable, which was hoof strain. Now, every time the foot hits the ground, there's a strain on the hoof, and that's going to vary depending on whether you're walking, trotting, or galloping, and it's going to vary depending on whether you're what speed you're doing that at. And what they found was there was an optimal speed given the variable of hoof strain, for walking. And there was an optimal speed for trotting, and there was an optimal speed for galloping, and they were the same speeds. So this point is not only optimal in terms of oxygen consumption, it's also optimal in terms of hoof strain, and we might assume in terms of very many other variables. Because an animal is a product of evolution, and evolution works on very, very many things all at once. So that a highly evolved form, like a horse, has been optimized with respect to very many variables. What we see here is that the horse can appear to be a machine that's optimized for walking, but the horse can also adopt a different form of organization, at which point it becomes a machine that's optimized for trotting, and then it can reorganize to become a machine that's optimized for galloping. Those are useful insights. Now, we're pushing back from a view of the brain has been responsible for everything. The brain will have a role to play, but so does the body, and so do these physical constraints. And by that, I mean nothing more surprising than the role, for example, of the floor when you're walking. I know you all can walk, but if I put you in the deep end of a swimming pool and I ask you to show me your walking movements, you won't be able to make them, because you need a firm support underneath your foot in order to exhibit your prowess at walking. This is strongly illustrated in the experiments done on mesencephalic cats by these Russian physiologists. In these cats, they're called mesencephalic because they've had a, an operation done to their brain which severs the higher order of the brain, the cerebral cortex on the outside, from the middle brain uh, and 
The midbrain structures, which are much older from an evolutionary point of view, the midbrain structures are necessary to keep the heart going um, and to keep breathing. But we tend to think of the newer parts of the brain, the cerebral cortex that lie on the outside, as being responsible for volitional movement. If you insert electrodes into some parts of that brain, of the outside of the brain, you'll cause the body to move. If you insert electrodes at other parts of the cerebral cortex, you'll cause hallucinations. It does depend where you do this, but we often think of movement as being strongly linked to this cerebral cortex, the outside of the brain. But in these particular cats, that's out of the picture. We've cut that off completely surgically. These cats can't even stand. They have no muscle tone. They're floppy cats. But if you put a sling under their belly and suspend them over a treadmill and turn the treadmill on, something quite remarkable happens. In the absence of any input from the higher brain areas at all, the legs self-organize into a coordinated gait. You can see here the left leg and the right leg are going through cycles with a fixed phase relationship among them. Furthermore, as we speed this up, and we can do that in two ways, we can speed up the treadmill or we can inject an electric current into their midbrain. As we speed them up, what we see is the fixed phase relationship between the legs abruptly changes from one gait pattern to another gait pattern. You can see it here. There's one phase relationship shifting to another phase relationship. This change happens in response to a non-specific change in the constraints under which the locomotion is happening, either a stronger treadmill or greater current applied to the midbrain. So by stimulating a single site, we can induce walking changes leading to a gait change, which is a change in the overall organization of the limbs. What if humans were quadrupeds? We're not very good quadrupeds because our arms are so much smaller than our legs. Our legs are a lot longer and more massive than our arms. But Scott Kelso devised this infernal device for turning his students into quadrupeds. You strap a student in there and you can put different weights on the different limbs and you can ask them now to move their legs and arms together. And when they do so, remarkably, with no practice whatsoever, they show coordination. That is, the legs and arms organize into these gates, distinct, distinct, discrete gates, in which the different limbs have fixed phase relationships with each other. In the jump here, the four limbs are in phase. In the bound here, the front limbs, that is, the arms are in phase and the legs are in phase, but the arms are in antiphase with the legs. Here's the pace in which the arm and the leg on one side are in phase. And here's the trot in which the arm and the diagonally opposite leg are in phase. Furthermore, as you speed up, you get shifts from one form of gait organization to another, so that at fast rates only two of these are stable. I think it's the jump and the pace, but I wouldn't swear to it. What's important here is that without any practice and without any experience of being a quadruped, these humans display discrete, coordinative modes of the same kind as every other quadruped. There's no learning involved. This is simply how the limbs work under the appropriate constraints. You can demonstrate much the same thing with a caterpillar, and don't do this, it's a horrible experiment. But if you, pull, if you start with a caterpillar that has very many legs, and you pull the legs off in pairs, the caterpillar will have no problem adjusting to its new number of legs. And you can do this for quite a large number of leg pairs until the caterpillar has no more than four or six leg pairs. Um, and what you get in each case is a spontaneous reorganization of the gait with no learning whatsoever. The animal deals with the situation of having a new number of legs and these animals have very little brains indeed. So what's going on here? Well we're pushing back against the notion of control and emphasizing instead that coordinated movement comes about in the presence of the appropriate constraints. This is a new language we're going to use to understand movement constraining a body that has very many degrees of freedom so that in interaction with the environment it becomes a simpler thing. It becomes coordinated so that the different parts become non-independent and we get the emergence of a pattern as if we had somehow become a machine devoted to a single goal. When we walk, in other words, the many degrees of freedom of the body become less as we temporarily assemble a locomotion machine. Remember our metronomes. They 
temporarily entered into a form of organization in which there was a superordinate pattern, the synchrony that emerged across them, surrendering some of their own autonomy in, the, in that endeavor. When you walk in the sense of a locomotion machine, the locomotion machine that is assembled is task-specific. You're probably sitting down right now, in which case you're not locomoting. So when you want to locomote, you assemble it. It's thrown together on the fly. That's the flexible assembly. And locomotion is more than just the brain or just the brain and muscles. It requires the whole body and the appropriate environmental constraints. And when we then observe the locomotion, we see so a system that has less degrees of freedom than some of its parts. This is quite remarkable. The theory from which this vocabulary comes is known as action theory or coordination dynamics. And when the body organizes, self-organizes into a machine for locomoting, we speak of that as a coordinative structure, or to adopt a term from business speak, a synergy. This term synergy just means that the diverse parts are working together towards a single goal. In the course of the day, you will then move into and out of different forms of organization, creating plucking machines, picking machines, scratching machines, catching, throwing, scrubbing, eating, and so on. It's a quite a remarkable perspective with which to view coordinated activity. And I'm aware that this is an awful lot of jargon, so what we're going to do now is we're going to fix some of these concepts with a very striking illustrative example. The key notion here is the notion of emergence. When we have multiple components, which are themselves animated, which have their own movement, source of movement, and they interact with each other in the presence of constraints, then we may get a pattern at a higher level that involves all these components and to which the components contribute. And nobody has to be in charge of this. This happens in physical systems all the time. One example of this is a tornado. We have an atmosphere which contains very many molecules, and those molecules are agitated. The heat and free energy in the atmosphere is essential to forming a tornado. If then we get the right atmospheric conditions or constraints, then the molecules of the air become non-independent as they form a vortex which is the tornado. So the tornado is an emergent pattern. There's no controller evolved. What we need is suitably energetic components and appropriate constraints. We can now illustrate this here with some dogs. In this example, the dogs, the individual puppy dogs are the components. Uh, they are independently driven. Each one is an agitated little being and also hungry. The appropriate and important environmental constraint here is a circular feeding dish, and under those Daddy, circumstances, this happens. Daddy, pinwheel here is the emergent pattern. The puppies are the components. The circular feeding dish provides the constraints. It's necessary that the components be themselves individually animated. They're not passive contributors to this. Each one remains autonomous. Remember the metronomes that asserted their own autonomy. Each one remains autonomous, but they coordinate. They become mutually coupled or entrained, giving rise to a superordinate pattern. This turns out to be a very powerful language for describing coordinated movement of the body. We'll stop there and pick the story up the next.